My name is Katya Gutierrez, and I was a Jehovah's Witness for 23 years. Christian and I escaped the Watchtower organization four years ago. The reason that we want to make this documentary is to bring awareness to the fact that the Jehovah's Witness organization destroys families' lives. We know of hundreds of thousands of other people just like us who've also had their lives destroyed and their families taken from them. These are their stories. Hello, my name is Jason Droboth. I was a Jehovah's Witness for the first 22 years of my life. I was born uh, a Jehovah's Witness. I was born in, in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, Canada and then um, came over to Calgary, Alberta, Canada um, when I was about four or five. Uh, our family came over. I got baptized when I was, I believe, 15 or 16, I think. Um, baptized in, in Calgary here at the Calgary Saddle Dome um, in the summer. And then I think recent, um, after that, about a year or two after that, I, I became an auxiliary pioneer and then became a, a full-time pioneer. As a kid, I always really wanted to handle the microphones. Mm -hmm. And because I'm a guy, I, was, I had the, the possibility of, of doing that. And so I, I handled the microphones at, at um, meetings and would hand them out to people as they would comment. I also um, would organize magazines and, and give them out to, to different people at the Kingdom Hall um, and different things around around the Kingdom Hall as well, like cleaning the snow and stuff like that. I had that privilege and mowing the lawn and stuff like that. And this is all volunteer work, right? Like you're not getting paid for any of this. Yeah, that's all volunteer work. Yeah. Yeah. And did you ever serve, could we call it serving in any specific role? Like I think you said you were... A pioneer or so I was I was a pioneer for um, a couple of years I believe so yeah I was a full-time pioneer where I had to spend I believe it was 70 hours out in the ministry um, knocking on people's doors and whatnot and, and talking to them trying to um, host Bible studies with people and and whatnot would you consider yourself that like you were a good Jehovah's Witness when you were in the organization, that you followed all the rules and, you know, that you participated the way they wanted you to participate? I was a, a really good witness, I like to think. And in fact, a lot of people, I know a lot of people when they hear that I'm no longer a witness, they're really shocked. And they, they thought that I would definitely, out of anyone, I would be a Jehovah's Witness for the rest of my life because I was very, I did everything by the book, or at least I tried to. And um, I, I didn't really break any of the rules. Uh, at least I try not to. Um, we go to all the meetings, always out in service. Um, didn't really drink all that much. I was kind to everyone. Um, I would study for all the meetings. I would uh, try to read my Bible every single day. Basically all the things that you're supposed to do as a Jehovah's Witness. Mm -hmm. I did quite well right and did you i guess you obviously weren't allowed to celebrate any holidays or anything like that as a Jehovah's witness right i didn't celebrate any holidays at all no birthday um christmas um halloween none of, none of those holiday none of those holidays and the first time i really realized that other people did and that i wasn't supposed to and that it would added it was some sort of distinction between me and other people was in elementary school when kids would bring in cupcakes or something for their birthday that they made and be handing them out and I would take one and then later on tell my mom about it and she'd tell me how I shouldn't be taking the cupcakes and, and celebrating with them which to me seems so innocent as, as, a, as a little child mm -hmm. and then slowly um, tried with all my might not to take the cupcakes as they'd be passed around 
um, because I knew I shouldn't be participating. Um, participating. Not really sure what the reasons were for it, but I, I definitely felt very excluded um, and like I was missing out. But even more so, it was just kind of that, just teaching me that I didn't, that I was different from them. And I didn't really understand why. Mm -hmm. We used to have, at one of our old houses when I was growing up, we used to have a service group there a, a couple times a week. And we would have book studies there when, when we used to have one hour long book studies. And so there would always be witnesses over at our house meeting. Um, and we had this one next door neighbor, um, or this, this couple, and they were really, really nice. And, and we would, you know, be good neighbors to them and they were good neighbors to us. And as we're leaving, if they're outside, we say hi and, and all that kind of thing. Um, our cat would always go over to their, to their house, to their backyard because he had a beautiful garden and our cat would spend all day running around in the, in the garden. And, and he loved having our cat there. And, um, and then one day we had a book study at our, at our house and everyone was outside. And one of the witnesses at, our, at the book study noticed our next door neighbor and then pulled my dad aside after and said, hey, I recognize that guy. I think he used to be an elder in the congregation that I used to go to. And now he's an apostate. And so my dad went to go confirm this later on in another day and he went and asked our next door neighbor and he said, yep, yeah, yeah, I used to be a Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, but I'm not anymore. And so my dad told him what the rules are, the Jehovah's Witness rules had to remind him and say, you know, we're not allowed to talk to you anymore. My family can't talk to you. And, and then my dad told us that we weren't allowed to, we shouldn't be talking to him anymore. And so ever since that time, we went from, you know, every time we're outside riding our bikes, we'd wave to him. Um, after that, if he was outside, we'd have to essentially ignore him and, and not talk to him at all. And it just seems so strange as a kid because you understand why it's happening because your parents explain, we, like, he's not a Jehovah's Witness, so we can't talk with him anymore. And you say, okay, I understand that. But you only stand, understand it so far. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, so he's not a Jehovah's Witness anymore, so I can't talk to him. Okay, but wait, why not? Why does it matter if he's... Because yesterday we were able to talk to him and now we're not allowed to talk to him anymore. An apostate, according to the Watchtower, is someone who rejects any of their official doctrine. You can also be considered an apostate if you no longer wish to be known as one of Jehovah's Witnesses or if you speak out against the organization. Even if you dare to just simply read the Bible on your own without the guidance of the Watchtower, you will be labeled an apostate and you will lose your family and friends. Um, so, you know how kids always just ask questions all the time. And as kids, we, we would just you know, ask those questions and, and did not, it just didn't make any sense. Right. But yeah. you just accept it. And that's just how it is as a kid. You know, you, yeah. you accept what your parents, what your parents say. You can have a pedophile in the organization um, and you mean nothing's done about it and people can talk to that person, but yet you can't talk to your neighbor anymore because they're not a Jehovah's Witness. Like it just seems like the standards of that is a little whack, right? It's funny because as as a kid, if, if your parents tell you, okay, you're not, you're no longer allowed to talk to our next door neighbor, they're doing that to protect you, right? Any parent would, if they're saying that, they're, they're trying to protect their own kids, right? And so that would assume that there's something, some sort of danger, or that that next door neighbor is dangerous in some way. And if the next door neighbor, say, was a known pedophile or something, indeed, yeah, you should, that you'd want your children to stay away from them, Right. But this, that wasn't the case. That wasn't the issue. It wasn't, um, he wasn't a pedophile or anything. He was just no longer a Jehovah's Witness. And so he was a danger to the family just for simply not being a Jehovah's Witness anymore. So I guess, I mean, you were born in it. You had all these privileges, um, privileges, and I mean, you were well-liked and you had good standing. So what caused you to one day not 
I mean, want to be a Jehovah's Witness. You thought it was, did you think it was true your, this, your whole life? Or what caused you to start questioning it? And how did that go? And when did that happen, I guess? I always thought it was true because it was everything that I was being told. Everyone around me was, was telling me it was true. You know, my parents were telling me and, and they wanted what, what was best for me. So, of, of course, I believe and I, I believe what, they, what they're telling me. And, um, and the whole community that I'm a part of, basically everyone that I know, they all believe the same thing. They're all doing all these actions that I'm told I'm supposed to do. So it just keeps reinforcing it that, yes, obviously this is true. And I never really doubted it as, as, like a, as a child and a, and a young teen at all until I hit around like 17 or something. Things always, when I was young, always seemed odd. There was always certain things that just seemed weird, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like this doesn't make sense. So there must be something wrong with the whole thing. It was just, oh, I don't understand this well enough. I need to try to understand it better. But once I was around 17, 18, then I started to question things a lot more. Those things that started to not really make a lot of sense um, kind of piled on more and more. And the difficulty is, as a Jehovah's Witness, you're supposed to go door to door and teach people what you believe. And um, in order to teach something properly, you have to know what you're, what you're teaching. You have to fully understand it from every single angle. Otherwise, you can't possibly teach someone. As soon as, soon as someone asks you something, um, if you don't have a proper understanding of it, you're not going to be able to answer their question and explain it properly. Um, so as I would go door to door and people would ask me questions, sometimes I'd be able to answer them, other times I wouldn't. And so I'd try to figure it out later on and try to fill in those gaps. And those gaps began compiling. There began to be more and more gaps as, as people at the door would ask me more and more questions and I was unable to answer them. The gaps just kept growing and growing and growing. I remember that this one time I was trying to figure out a good response to people at the door when they say Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult. And because it kept happening on multiple occasions. And so I decided I was going to try to get to the bottom of it, have a really good response for them to show them, to tell them why we are not a cult. And so as a little exercise, I, uh, with my parents, I sat down and I, I said, okay, I'm going to read to you three different definitions from the dictionary. And I want you to match them up with the appropriate um, term. So the definitions that I'm going to be reading are from these three terms. The first term is religion. The sec second one is sect. And the final one is cult. So I'm going to read these three definitions and match them up with the appropriate one of those three terms. And so I started reading off the first one, which just so happened to be the definition for the word cult. And before I could even finish it, my mom said, oh, Jehovah's Witnesses. And I said, that wasn't, that wasn't even a term. That wasn't even an option. Why'd you say that? And she kind of backtracked. Oh, I don't know. And I guess the definition for cult was so accurately uh, paralleled with, with Jehovah's Witnesses that as soon as she heard the definition, she thought, oh, that's Jehovah's Witnesses. Wow. And I closed the dictionary and thought, wow, this like, exercise went horribly wrong. <laughs> the research that I did before, uh, um, the research that I did um, where I was researching only the, the literature that I was supposed to look at, so stuff that's given out by the Watchtower organization, so all the magazines, the books, um, talking to people who are also Jehovah's Witnesses, talking to elders, all, all, all these things. And I looked there only at first for the answers to my questions. And sometimes they would provide the answers that were satisfactory, other times they couldn't. And so that was kind of the first stage. And I wouldn't look anywhere else for information not on the internet. I wouldn't look at, at certain books at the library. Um, I wouldn't talk to other people who are not witnesses about it, trying to inquire and, and fill in those gaps. And then I reached a point where that method was just no longer working anymore. There were just too many gaps and it just wasn't, I wasn't able to find the information that was answering my questions. And then that's the second period that I entered where I began looking at outside sources, began looking on the internet, went to the library, 
um, looking at different books that are not established um, watchtower approved books. In fact, some that are essentially banned books, really. And that's when those gaps started to fill in a lot, but they were filling in in ways I hoped that they wouldn't be filled in. Hmm. So were you scared during this process? Like, could you just go to the library and read these books? Or did you feel like you had to hide? Like, how was that experience for you? So there's certain websites that are absolutely off limits. Um, if you want to learn anything about Jehovah's Witnesses or, or anything to do with that, you're supposed to only look at Jehovah's Witness literature, Watchtower literature, and it's really forbidden um, and extremely dangerous as a witness to look outside and to look at the internet. And some of these websites, for example, Wikipedia, like just simply searching Wikipedia on Wikipedia, Jehovah's Witnesses, it's a big no-no. Um, YouTube, searching YouTube, um, at the time YouTube was just starting to really emerge. That's a big no-no. I remember telling my parents that I had searched um, Jehovah's Witnesses for some reason online. And this was year when I was really young. Um, and instead of my parents saying, oh, really, what'd you find? It was, oh, you have to be really, really, really careful because there's a lot of lies out there. Um, so I realized, okay, the internet, you have to stay away from the internet. Mm -hmm. But finally, I decided to look on the internet a little bit more, looking at Wikipedia, at YouTube, just different websites and whatnot. And I remember my hands shaking and, and sweating and constantly looking over my shoulder and only doing it at, at home when nobody else was at home. And if someone would come home, I'd have to turn it off and I'd have to have it in some sort of um, uh, like secret search browser and to have, make sure I deleted all my history because if any of it was was found, I would be in deep, deep trouble. If someone, if my, my parents or someone had found that I searched Jehovah's Witnesses on Wikipedia even, um, they'd start asking questions and and start uncovering certain things. I went to the library, the local public library, to rent out certain books or just, just to look and see what, what's out there. And I found a good place in this one library where I was in a corner against a wall and I could sit there and see out everywhere. And so I could see if there's any other, any um, witnesses who happened to be there. If they approached, then I would have to hi uh, time to hide the book. But the thing is, the books all tend to have, they, they have covers, right? With And of course, the titles are, are in big, bold letters. Right. And so a trick that I would use is I would take other books, um, other harmless books. I'd have a book maybe on gardening or something like that <laughs> in front of it. And I'd cover, you know, this book that I'm reading um, about religion or, or about science or something like that. And I'd cover it or I'd take the dust jacket off of some innocent book and replace it with the book that I'm actually reading just as another, because if I was caught and it wasn't like it, it, it wasn't a, an illogical fear. It was a very real fear that if I legitimately was caught by another Jehovah's witness and they saw what I was reading, they'd have to tell on me and then things would start to unravel again and I'd be in deep trouble. I would sometimes take these books to other locations around the city. I went out to this, in the summertime, I would I would take it out to this dock on um, a reservoir within the city. And this dock went way out into the water. And I would go sit way at the end of the dock so that nobody could sneak up behind me. And I could see 360 degrees around me, anyone approaching from afar. And I, that would give me time to be able to hide these books. Um, these books are not evil books. These are literally just like a book on evolution or a book maybe critiquing Jehovah's Witnesses or, or um, like even the Book of Mormon or something, you know, just looking at different books that if it wasn't approved Watchtower stuff and was um, could maybe ha cause any sort of doubts in your mind, it would, um, that essentially is a, is a, a banned book. So I, I took this, this book to a nearby McDonald's and I stayed there for hours, for probably five or six hours, reading this book. And it was blowing my mind and, and um, exciting me, but also terrifying me at the same time, these things that I was learning. And 
the whole time I, I knew that as I'm learning these, you know, you can't unlearn what you've learned. And as I'm learning, I, I can foresee a certain path that I'm starting to take now. And I have almost have no choice now because I'm, I've learned these things. How can I unlearn them? And how can I keep, you know, doing what I used to do now knowing the things that I know? And so I stayed at this McDonald's and I came outside after five or six hours of being there and my, my vehicle had been towed. And so I thought, okay, great. How am I going to get home? So I went to, to call someone to pick me up and, and help me out. But everyone I knew that would help me out were all witnesses. And if they were to pick me up, I had this book in my hand and I had nowhere to put it and they'd ask questions and, you know, I couldn't be seen with this, with this, this book. So instead of calling anyone, instead of calling my parents or instead of calling a friend or something, the only other option I could think of other than throwing the book in the garbage or something like that was to walk home. And so I walked home and it was like 14 kilometers or so and took me almost three hours to walk home. Like that was, that was the best option essentially. Because if I was caught with this book, I'd be in big, big trouble. Now, after you did this research and you, you were starting to know all this stuff that can't be unknown, right? After you learn it, um, what did you do? What was your decision? Like, were you like, okay, I don't want to be your husband this anymore? What, what, what was the process with that? What happened? It's not an easy decision. And I wouldn't even say that you have a choice. You know, choice is not really, it's a little bit of an illusion, you know? to think that you have certain choices in life, like you do have choice to an extent, but I no longer really, I couldn't choose to keep, uh, well, I tried to, to, even after reading all these things and, and learning these new things and, and having my perspectives change, um, I tried to just continue being a witness regardless. But the thing is you can't just really be just a standby witness. Just fake it's it. pretty hard to do. Some people are able to do it, but it's, it's pretty difficult especially for, for myself. And so I would have to go, go door to door and talk to people about the Bible and about um, our beliefs and why, you know, our beliefs are true and why they should, you know, study with us to learn about our true beliefs and how, you know, um, our way of life is, is the best way of life when I didn't believe any of it. Like, how could, how could you keep doing that? It's so disingenuous and unsustainable like i was just running on empty because i'm going door to door knocking saying hey you know here's this thing it's definitely true but i'm thinking no it's not i hope that they don't i hope they just close the door on me and i can just be on my way so i tried i tried but like i said once you learn something you can't unlearn it mm -hmm. and so i no longer had a choice like what else could i do and so I started, I, I was honest with, with certain people, honest with my parents and then honest with others in the congregation. And they thought it was kind of a fad and thought, you know, I just need to, needed to pray more and just needed to read more. And I'm telling them, no, I've been doing this for years. Like I've been trying I've, all the things you're recommending that I read and, and all the things you recommend I do. I've been trying this for years and years and it's not working out. So they were trying to suppress your doubts with their own literature. Just... You have this doubt, just read this magazine. Do it, read it more and you'll yeah, feel better. Yeah, read this. Or just don't ask those questions anymore. Put that know? thought Why away. is it such a big deal that you have the answer to this question? Mm -hmm. Well, it is a big deal because like, I'm trying to go door to door and tell people you know, this is the truth. And then they ask me this question. And what, what am I going to tell them? Like, oh, don't worry about that. that the, the answer doesn't matter to that. Don't ask those questions. And they're going to say, oh, okay, this sounds like a great thing to sign up to. Yeah. It's, it, you can't, it, like, it just doesn't work out that way. Mm -hmm. I remember telling my, my dad, telling my parents at the same time that I don't th think I believe in this anymore. I, I'm not sure that this is the right re religion. And it wasn't me saying, no, this is definitely all wrong. It was just me saying, I don't believe this anymore. I, I just don't think it's true anymore, but I'm not sure. And my poor father, he just collapsed on the floor crying as if he had just heard that his son had died. 
like right in front of me. I was, I felt like a ghost almost like I was watching, like the cops had come to the front door and said, sorry, your son died in a horrific car accident. I felt like I was watching that scene almost. And all I was saying is, I don't believe this anymore. Wow. And he had lost his son right, right then and there. And most kids don't want to hurt their parents. Right. And so of course, like I want the relationship with my parents. Right. And I want to be close to them, but more so I don't want to hurt them. And that would, that's probably the most difficult part of it is, is knowing, okay, if I am honest with what I believe and if I tell people and if like, if I just accept, you know, who I am now, I'm going to hurt them. So that's why I would try not, you know, I would just try to still be a Jehovah's Witness and go door to door, even though, even though I, I knew I didn't believe it, but it just doesn't work that way. It, mm. it, it only worked for so long. And finally, you just had to be honest, mm-hmm. but it's like a made up, it, it's, it's like a made up problem, right? It's like, why did they have to be hurt? Yeah, these rules are unnecessary. Yeah, there's all these up. rules in this make-believe world. Yeah. That's so okay. after, you know, after your parents found out about this, what happened? Did they have to tell other elders in the congregation about your stance now? Did you go and talk to other elders? Did elders call you? Were you disfellowshipped? Like, what happened? Um, everyone tried their best to try to help me out and help me, you know, build my faith. My parents included, they really like, they went full time, essentially just trying to help me in any way, way that they possibly could. And cause it like, it meant the world to them. Right. And same with, um, friends in the con- congregation and leaders, like elders in the congregation. A lot of them reached out to me and really tried their best to like, try to help me. But again, they're trying, they're trying to help me, but the way that they're trying to help me is, is not actually helping me. Right. They really genuinely want what's best for me, but in their mind, what's best for me is to be part of this religion and that's it. Nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. You have to be part of this religion. If you're not, you have nothing. Mm. And that's, that's all there is. So they genuinely, of course, want the best for me and want help, but that's like, that's the only way Mm -hmm. to help me Mm -hmm. in their opinion. Right. Yeah, and individuality isn't as important as just staying in the organization, right? Mm-hmm. Like, even if that's not who you are, even if that's not what you believe, and it makes you more happy to be who you are, that's not important, really, yeah. at the end of the day. Right? It's yeah. everyone being the same, everyone believing the same thing. Yeah, and finally, one of the leaders in the, the congregation, the, the PO, which I think is the Kobe now or, or whatever, um, came over on, upon my dad's request, um, to help me. And I had a long list of all these questions that were genuinely, um, concerning me, all these, all these things that I was trying to, trying to find answers to. And it was like months worth of, of, of work and questions that I had. And I was really looking for someone to try to help me again. And so he came over and he talked more so just instilled kind of guilt in me more for questioning things. And then finally, after talking for 20 minutes, half an hour said, okay, let's, let's see what your questions are now. And I felt totally dejected after this conversation. Finally, I was like, okay, here's one, this question here. And I asked it and he just looked at me like I was a complete idiot. And like, how, how dare you? Like, what are you, like, why, would you why are that? you asking this question? And he didn't answer it and he didn't, and we didn't look at any, any other questions and he left and I felt even worse after. Every, everyone knew that I wasn't like sinister or anything, or I wasn't trying to stir up trouble. I was genu- genuinely going through difficult times and, and these things were like really concerning me. So people were just trying to help me, but not necessarily like, kick me out or anything but the pressure was just too immense and so I decided I just needed to get away and just have time on my own just to think and decompress and really without all the pressure on me and so I saved up money over uh, over a few months and finally went on a on a long trip to Central America and I, I traveled there on my own for seven months traveled through and it was really like a formative time for me where I was able to step back and research just like the pressure was lifted now i could finally explore and 
and research and learn um, without the pressure of coming to a certain conclusion. And the conclusion ended up being me not believing in the religious doctrines of um, Jehovah's Witnesses and me actually disagreeing with a lot of it. And so I sent in a letter and said to the headquarters and said, I don't want to be um, considered a, a Jehovah's Witness um, anymore for such and such reasons. Um, but I hope to maintain all my, my relationships and whatnot. And um, when I, a few days before I was flying back to Canada, back home, um, this letter got like it, it got to the to the branch and um my my dad basically texted me and said i got this letter and you're not welcome back at, at our house and that we need to protect our uh, he needs to protect his family from me his family yeah. from you aren't you aren't you his family yeah that must have and been so like, oh. that was a few days before i came back to calgary after being in this place for seven months and having all these experiences, wanting to tell my my parents, you know, all these things that I had been through and experienced and all these new things I had learned. And and a few days before I come back, I'm not allowed back at the house because I'm a, I'm a threat to the family. I was kind of expecting, like I knew what would happen, yeah. right? Like, you know the rules and the rules are like, once you're not Joe's window. If you don't obey, if you don't follow all the rules, then you lose all your family and friends and that they're all going to shun you because they have to shun you. And so I knew it would happen, but, but like, what friendly. other option do I have? You know, yeah. do I just keep lying to everyone? I came back home and back to my home city that I was raised in and felt like a foreigner in my, in my own city, my own hometown, because I didn't know anyone. It, like, well, er everyone I knew was, was shunning me. Um, my work was any work that I had ever done was all with Jehovah's Witnesses, all different Jehovah's Witnesses, and so I didn't have any work. Um, I had nowhere to, nowhere to go, no, nowhere to live, mm -hmm. right? No social circle, nothing. It was like, okay, I recognize all these streets. This is like my old stomping ground. This is my home, but without all the people. It was weird. It was like, it's almost like, like fifty or a hundred years had passed, or something like that, and, and, everyone, died. and everyone had died, or something, or but they didn't. Everyone's there, you know. You see them walking in the streets. Right? And they ignore you. And so, like, I had no supports at all. And that's, that was really, like, dangerous, right? Because I wasn't in a good mental state. I've been, like, going through all these difficult things and just been rejected by my family and friends. No job, almost no money left. I came back to Calgary late at night, arrived at the airport, and just slept in the airport that first night and then woke up in the morning and realized that aside, aside from the security guard kicking me out, really nobody was going to wake me up and help me out. No one was going to go there, uh, like see me and say, Hey, like, let's, let's, you know, um, you know, we're here for you or whatever. Like I really had to just, if I, if I wasn't to get up on my own, uh, on my, with my own energy, like, I wouldn't be able to get up essentially. So I realized from that moment on that, like I had to do it for myself and people would help me, but like ultimately um, it had to be me who was taking the initiative. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I got up and, and went out and, and got help from other people. And I knew that I really, really wanted to become a scientist. And for the first time in my life, I thought I could actually become a scientist. Like that blew my mind that, it's not just some unattainable goal. I could actually do it, right? It's now an option. And so I applied for um, for school at a couple of universities within the city um, to get a Bachelor of Science degree. And that that really, really helped a lot to give focus to my life, just to have like one, one thing to work towards. And I remember walking through these uh, through the campus and just my mind was blown. And it was like, it was like a spiritual experience walking through these hallways. And I was thinking like, when I got my acceptance letter, I'm, I get to go here. I get to go to this university and learn these things mm -hmm. from, from like professionals, 
you know, I, I get to learn from professional paleontologists and geologists and chemists. And um, I took a whole bunch of different courses, even um, religious studies courses and philosophy and, and all these different things. And just like, I was just on cloud nine the whole time. Well, mm-hmm. at, at the beginning, at least until the, the hard work really set in. But just like that feeling of, I get to go here. I get to learn these things. And with no judgment too. Like it was such a contrast to my experience with learning before where I would have to cower in corners at the public library with a, uh, a different dust jacket on, a, on this book that I'm reading, worried that I'm going to get find, found out and worried I, I w- and being afraid of what I was about to learn because I knew the consequences. Whereas at university it was, I, could, I get to learn these things and I get to question them all too. I get to question these professionals and they don't get upset. They, they love that. That's what it's all about, right? I just think of the contrast between like a, a lecture or something or some special speaking engagement versus sitting at an assembly or the, the kingdom hall. Could you imagine being at the kingdom hall and putting your hand up to ask the speaker a question to ask them to explain themselves. They're not there for that. When you put your hand up at the kingdom hall, it's to regurgitate the answer. They, they ask a question of you and you regurgitate the information. If you don't understand it, you're not to put your hand up and ask, I don't understand this, or this doesn't make sense, or just playing devil's advocate here. That's just, that's unheard of. And yet that's the complete, like, it's the complete opposite of what was happening within my lecture halls. Um, I would put my hand up and ask the professor and put them on the spot. And they treasured that and they would try to give me their best answer. And it was like a true learning experience where you weren't worried about the answers. Hmm. So really they encourage learning and they encourage independent thinking, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. That's a healthy thing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was a very, very healthy, and it's it's more challenging, right? You're not just being told the answers; you're mm-hmm. being told the to question the answers. They'll mm-hmm. give you an answer and and then say if you like prove it wrong or something, you know, mm-hmm. like question those answers that you're not t- supposed to just regurgitate. Jehovah's Witnesses are strongly discouraged by their organization not to pursue higher education. This includes college or university. The reason behind this is because it is considered extremely impractical and even unnecessary. Rather, instead, you are encouraged to spend as much of your time as possible converting people by knocking on their doors or working at their world headquarters known as Bethel and producing more literature that is used to convert people. These are all non-paying jobs. The cost of obtaining university training is not our primary concern. It is the potential for spiritual harm that has moved us to provide the cautions we have shared in the past. If we are in continued association with those who do not believe the same, it can erode our thinking and convictions. It is one thing to work on a job with others and Quite another matter to immerse oneself in an institution of learning. Higher learning can easily influence thinking and attitudes. I have long said, the better the university, the greater the danger. The most intelligent and eloquent professors will be trying to reshape the thinking of your child and their influence can be tremendous. What secular skills will we be promoting? Skills that'll be useful to God's organization now and after Armageddon. For example, we need construction skills around the world right now. And think about this. We will not need doctors or lawyers after Armageddon, but we will need carpenters and plumbers and similar construction trades. The world really has nothing to offer that can give us lasting joy. But focusing on our service for Jehovah is truly rewarding. 
but college is what you make of it really there's so it, it's so diverse there's so many different age groups there's so many different types of people so many different different ethnicities people of different um interests and whatnot and um like it's really not what i thought it was going to be like way back it was it's, it wasn't what my first perception of college was really um it was just an open place to learn and to make relationships to meet people and to to um better yourself are you now did you graduate or I, yeah i finally graduated yeah yeah um with a bachelor in science and i majored in geology and um really quite a um quite proud of that it was really really difficult but mm -hmm. um you know it's warranted to to seek out answers to try to get to any sort of truth it really takes a lot of work and and the answers are not always always that simple you know every time that i would be asking questions and, and doubting things um people would always tell me not to go look in certain places don't talk to any extra homeless witnesses because they're only going to tell you lies don't trust them they're just bitter and this whole time I had always been thinking, what if I was to go, what if I'm looking to buy a brand new car and I talk to the salesman and I say, what do people think of these cars? What, what do they think of, of your company? He says, people love it. Everyone loves it. It's so good. It's the best. And then I, and then I say, um, should I go talk to some um, past owners of your cars who don't own your cars anymore? And he says, no, definitely do not go talk to them. Don't talk to anyone who used to own one of our cars because they're just bitter. But why are they bitter and why should I not be talking to them? That should be raising some red flags. Hmm. And that thought always did raise red flags. And so, um, you know, when I was when I was a witness, it was like, no, this is 100% true and don't question it. Because if you do question it, and I ha have had elders tell me, you know, if you start questioning it too much, you're gonna, like it, it's gonna fall apart pretty quickly yeah and that is not a very solid um, foundation of truth no. you know if, if someone can poke holes in it you know mm -hmm. without even trying then there's a good chance that you're being misled um, for someone else's gain 